I have some hazy memories as a kid of learning about American slavery. One of the things that was really focused on, and looking back, I'm not really sure why, but we learned a lot about sort of the layout of a plantation where the slave owners might have lived, where the fields might have been uh, worked, and of course where the slave quarters were. And we viewed a lot of illustrations of sort of slave families sitting outside their cabins, families together playing music or working or just going about their daily lives. The problem with this sort of focus on plantation life, particularly in grade school, is that in many ways it's misleading. And in some ways, it might even be a total myth. Last year, the Washington Post ran a sort of series of articles investigating slavery and how it's taught in American public schools. Part of this series of articles included one that basically interviewed a number of notable historians of American slavery, and they sort of go through what they see as some of the myths of slavery, stuff that people grow up in the public school system learning that turns out to be either misleading or not true or emphasizing sort of the wrong things that probably shouldn't be emphasized and underemphasizing some of the things that might actually turn out to be more important in the long run. The first myth that this article highlights is the idea that slavery was a, quote, benign institution, and enslavers were fundamentally kind. Now, I don't know who's teaching this, but presumably someone is somewhere, and I think I might know the source of this mix-up and this sort of logic that might lead someone to say that slavery was a benign institution, even though looking hard at the evidence shows otherwise. Many historians tend to look at slavery through economic terms, and historians who think like this often tend to view the slave experience and the experience of the slave owners through that economic lens. So I've read historians and I've actually sat in lectures where historians will say, look, slavery was an economic institution and as a slave owner, it doesn't make financial sense to just be running around killing your slaves or torturing your slaves or doing some of these horrible things that would lead to your slave not being able to produce as much economic output. So in the view of people like this, perhaps in some sense, slavery was an institution that involved slave owners who at times were kind to their slaves because of this economic return on investment idea. The problem with this view, at least in my opinion, is that yes, it might be true that at times, it would make economic sense to treat slaves humanely, but to me at least, it seems obvious that at other times, it makes plenty of economic sense to beat and torture and potentially even kill. It also makes plenty of economic sense to do dehumanizing things like separating families. It might even make economic sense to instill a culture of fear and terror on a plantation. So you don't get to have it both ways. Probably the prototypical example of this would be looking at the Middle Passage experience of many slaves who had to travel from Africa to the Americas in the holds of these just terrifyingly overcrowded and disease-ridden and disgusting ships. And in that instance, the reason they were so overcrowded and the reason they were so horrifyingly terrible from a conditions perspective was because it made precisely that same economic sense for the slave owners. They looked at it as sort of a numbers game and if they could pack as many slaves 
into these horrible conditions as possible, ultimately that was going to lead to a better return on their investment than if they treated the slaves humanely. So to me at least, this sort of myth that slavery might have been a benign institution and enslavers were kind to the slaves only makes sense if you're looking at things from this economic point of view and only if within that economic point of view you're only focusing on the times where it made economic sense for slave owners to be nice to their slaves as opposed to the myriad of examples where it made plenty of economic sense to treat them terribly. Another reason why this sort of myth of slavery as a benign institution and enslavers as being fundamentally kind might be out there, according to the historians in the piece, they say that big rebellions, stuff like the Gabriel Prosser Rebellion, now it's just known as the Gabriel Rebellion, but that or Nat Turner, these sorts of big slave rebellions that happened relatively rarely on a large scale, and maybe even something like the Amistad Rebellion, something I covered in one of my podcasts earlier that you can check out. But the idea, according to historian Hassan Jeffries, is that if you only focus on these big, large-scale slave rebellions, it might make it seem like there wasn't that much resistance by slaves against slave owners. You could be a kid growing up in American public schools. You might learn about those two large-scale slave rebellions, and you might think, well, it must not have been so bad if there was only two rebellions over the course of the decades and decades of American slavery. The problem with this sort of emphasis in the school system is that Yes, it might have been true that large-scale rebellions like Nat Turner were relatively rare, but you also have to look at the fact that large-scale rebellion is not the only type of resistance that can take place. Furthermore, you might have to look at the reasons why large-scale rebellions like Nat Turner might not have always taken place all the time. Historian Kwame Jeffries says, quote, Rebellion, though, was not the only way that enslaved African Americans fought back. Their resistance took many forms, from highly visible attempts to flee bondage to nearly imperceptible acts of sabotage and subterfuge. And while rebellion sought total liberation from slavery, most forms of resistance strove for something much less, for making life a bit more bearable until the day of Jubilee finally arrived. Regardless of form or function, Slavery was never ending. As long as slavery existed, African Americans resisted. End quote. The idea is kind of if you want to get the full picture of slavery from the African American perspective, you can't just focus on these big Hollywood style rebellions. You have to focus on the day to day acts of resistance that define the lives of millions of slaves over the course of time. Jeffries says, quote, Teaching resistance effectively requires focusing on more than a handful of highly visible and extremely dramatic attempts to secure freedom. Accordingly, teachers must push beyond rebellion. Uprisings make clear that African Americans who engaged in rebellion opposed slavery. But because insurrections were so rare, when they are taught in isolation, students are left with the impression that the vast majority of enslaved people who did not rebel accepted their bondage. Some even interpret this to mean that African Americans were complicit in their own enslavement. Teachers have to talk about how enslaved people tried to minimize the amount of energy they expended toiling in fields by slowing the pace of work, feigning illness, breaking farming implements, injuring animals, and sabotaging crops, and how they took for themselves life's essentials, from food to clothing which they consumed, shared, traded, and sold. End quote. Jeffries goes on to discuss other ways of resistance that slaves took part in. This could be from learning skilled trades and trying to use these skills to make money, profit, trade, and sometimes even undermine slave owners. He talks about how 
Sometimes slaves would damage people's property, barns, storage sheds, basically economic retaliation, as he calls it. Jeffries also points out what he calls cultural resistance, where slaves did whatever they could to form families, marry, bear children, have religious practices, make music. So there's all of these ways that slaves could resist that were not exactly these big-scale rebellions. And I think all of this sort of demonstrates how fragile teaching about slavery can be. And it shows how if you frame things the wrong way, or if you emphasize certain things without emphasizing other things, you could lead a student of history down a path that doesn't fully understand what was going on with American slavery. And really, you can apply those principles to any topic of history where you sort of have these issues of framing and emphasis and context. And when you don't teach those things effectively and you don't include all of those important historical elements, you might get a myth like slavery was benign and enslavers were fundamentally kind to their slaves. The second myth that this article goes over is the idea of slave families staying together. I did mention earlier some of my earliest memories of learning about slavery did include these images of slave cabins where families were sitting outside and going about their lives. And a trio of historians and professors, Dana Barry, Kefalyn Brown, and Anthony Brown, point out that this is a very misleading way to think about slavery. In reality, most slaves were sold between four to five times in their lives, and most were probably separated from their families. They say, quote, most enslaved people experience sales and separations four to five times in their lifetime. This means that they were separated from their families more often than not. Newspaper accounts reporting on auctions listed the human property for sale and family groupings, but buyers rarely kept families intact. They purchased specific enslaved people to suit their needs and their priorities. End quote. I think this quote matches the economic view of slavery where slave owners were going to do whatever benefited them economically. And in many places and in many times, separating families and keeping spouses away from each other, keeping children away from their parents, that made sense for the slave owners economically. In fact, slave auctions were known as the weeping time. There was this constant atmosphere among the slaves of fear for themselves, that they could go somewhere else where conditions might be worse, or just the fact that they might go somewhere else and be away from their families and comrades that they had been with. So it is important to study how slaves were able to maintain those family bonds, how they were able to subvert institutions and norms that were designed to keep them down, and how they persisted in this context of sort of family humanity. According to this trio of knowledgeable historians and professors that I cited, it's critical to look at primary documents when you're teaching about slavery, and it's always important to include primary documents of the slave's perspective and really focusing on this family element and how families could often be separated is important to the study of American slavery. Historian Walter Johnson says a lot of things in his little part of the article here, but one of the things he alludes to is this sort of myth that it was strictly the Union and strictly Abraham Lincoln and his Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves. This could be a misleading framing because it fails to point out the key role that blacks themselves played in their own liberation, whether it was through those acts of resistance that we talked about, or whether it was through enlisting in the Union Army, 
as 200,000 black soldiers did by the end of the war. I talked about this in the interview I did with S.C. Gwynn, where he points out that these 200,000 black soldiers really did tip the tide of the war in favor of the Union Army. Another myth about slavery that the article goes over is that slavery was strictly a rural phenomenon. So it is true that most of the 4 million slaves who were living in America right before the Civil War broke out were on large plantations or rural area. But there were also urban blacks who were enslaved, and these people played a huge role really in the building of America, metaphorically and physically. Historian Leslie Harris says, quote, Before the Revolutionary War, enslaved African labor was critical to the construction and survival of cities from Boston to New Orleans. Even in Georgia, the only colony founded to be free from slavery, Europeans used enslaved labor to build Savannah, the colony's first port. By 1750, Georgia had repealed its official ban on slavery, and the Savannah port, built by slaves, became a hub in the Atlantic slave trade. New York and Rhode Island vied to be the capital of the North American slave trade. By early 18th century, Newport and Providence, Rhode Island, had outdone New York as the main North American suppliers of slaves to the southern colonies and the Caribbean. End quote. So it wasn't just an urban phenomenon. There were slaves who worked in urban areas. They worked in labor jobs, and much of it was skilled labor. Harris goes on to say, quote, And in all urban and rural settlements, enslaved people provided labor beyond agriculture. Enslaved men joined European armies in providing military aid, worked the docks loading and unloading ships, and learned skilled labor alongside European family members and indentured servants ranging from blacksmithing to carpentry to tailoring and beyond. Enslaved women and children provided domestic labor and marketed home-produced goods, End quote. Harris goes on to say, quote, Enslaved black women worked as domestics, seamstresses, and cooks for enslavers. Southern cities also served as centers for trading in enslaved people and slave-produced goods. Southern ports along the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic coast made money shipping slaves throughout the South and slave-produced goods to the northern states and Europe. New Orleans vied with New York for the position of leading port in the nation in the 19th century. End quote. Now, this stuff about African Americans working as slaves, not just in rural areas, but also urban areas, might seem sort of ancillary to the larger case of the majority of people, the majority of slaves who lived on either plantations or rural areas, but Harris points out that this is actually crucial to understanding the overall importance of slavery. She says, quote, Why is it important to recognize that urban areas contain slavery too? One reason is to understand the expansiveness and possibilities of this system of labor, which is as old as human history. Even more important, however, is the necessity to realize that people of African descent were capable of working at any form of labor. End quote. The final myth that the article goes over is the idea that African Americans were the only slaves. When slavery gets mentioned, I think most people probably think about the African-American experience, and probably rightfully so, but historian Andre Resendez points out that there were also two and a half to five million Native Americans who were enslaved during the colonial period in the New World. In contrast to African-American slavery, these Native American slaves were often women and children. And in many ways, this Native American slavery flies under the radar because a lot of it depends on how you define slavery. Resendez explains, quote, The Spanish crown forbade Indian slavery as early as 1542. The Mexican Republic granted citizenship rights to all natives born within the country in the 1820s, and the U.S. Congress passed the 13th Amendment prohibiting both 
slavery, and involuntary servitude, a formulation that opened the possibility of liberation of all Native Americans held in bondage. Yet Indian slavery persisted. One of the most striking aspects of this other slavery is that, because it had no legal basis, it was extremely difficult to extinguish. Forms of Indian slavery continued in the United States and elsewhere in the hemisphere through the end of the 19th century, and in remote areas even later. Disguised as debt peonage or penal service, this other slavery, invisible and often posing as legal work, is the direct forerunner of the types of slavery practiced today. According to the latest estimate of the Walk Free Foundation, an international human rights organization based in Australia, 40 million people in 167 countries live in some form of modern-day slavery. It is forbidden all over the world, yet not a single region of our globe has been spared from this scourge. Slavery continues to thrive because its beneficiaries resort to legal subterfuge to compel people to work under the threat of violence and offering absurdly low or no compensation. The 400-year experience of Native Americans with this other slavery makes clear there is nothing new about this. End quote. Resendez says a lot in a relatively short amount of words there, and it's tough to parse out sort of the nuances here, but I think what he's pointing out is that for Native Americans, particularly during colonial times, slavery was a thing. Indians were sent to the Caribbean. In most cases, oftentimes, they sometimes worked in these situations where Again, it depends on how you define slavery. And if you look at that 40 million number of slaves right now in the modern era, I don't really know enough about that topic to comment, but I would think it depends, again, on how you define slavery. And I think what he's pointing out is that if you define it too narrowly or too broadly, then people who are looking to take advantage of other human beings can sort of get around that legal terminology and whether or not you want to call it slavery or not, there's a lot of people in this world suffering pretty badly. At the end of the day, these myths that these historians spent time in this article rebutting came from this project where the Washington Post went out to determine how slavery was being taught in American public schools. So they did surveys with students and teachers. They interviewed teachers and administrators. And ultimately, I'm not sure exactly how scientific the study was, whether it would hold up to, you know, sort of statistically significant scientific scrutiny. But I do think a lot of these myths are there in the school system, and if that's the case, you have to wonder why. That's another one I'm not sure I know the answer to. I think anybody who pays attention to some of these battles you see in the news over public education and textbook use and what sorts of standards different states are teaching to their kids I think anyone who pays attention to that stuff might come up with some cynical answers that I'm not sure I disagree with. But I think at the end of the day, you have to have people that care, whether it's students, teachers, administrators, parents, just everyday civilians. You have to have a culture of people who care about, one, getting the facts of the historical record correct, or at least using a historical process that lends itself to analyzing what is correct and what isn't given biases and perspectives and different points of view. And I think, too, you have to care about the individual suffering of people throughout history and particularly the plight of slaves and that caring has to show in the way you conduct history. In my opinion, a focus on the individual lives of ordinary people has to be one of the primary focuses of good historical study. Mm -hmm. 